everyone my name is Mariska and welcome to our online series women of the bible part two so last week Angie reminded us of the power of persistent prayer encouraging us to truly pray with confidence knowing that God hears every word and so today we are so privileged to continue this remarkable journey by exploring the story of yet another woman in the Bible and seeing how God's promises shines through her life. And so we will also be sending and blessing you with a reflection card, which we will send on the WhatsApp group. We invite you to take this reflection card to delve deeper into the conversations as you make it part of your quiet time with the Lord. We will share the link to this reflection card in the chat box so you can download it or even in the comment section on Facebook, as well as the link to join the WhatsApp group so that you can receive all the necessary and important information regarding this series. But please use the chat box, even the comment section on Facebook to share with us your comments and questions. And so if you would like to rewatch today's session or share it with a friend or a family member, you are welcome to find it on our Facebook page and even our YouTube platform. And before I introduce our speaker for today, let us just become quiet for a moment and just pray. Father, thank you for this incredible opportunity where we can be reminded of your word. Lord, your word is active and powerful and still relevant for us today. There is so much revelation and freedom locked up in the pages of scripture, Lord. And may we sink ourselves deep into the words that you have so powerfully preserved for us throughout the ages, Lord. And may we really just come to know how, how crucial and how central your word should be in our lives, Lord. May you grow our understanding of it, deepen our knowledge of it, Lord, and just increase our love and devotion towards your word. May we truly become faithful disciples, learners, students of your living word, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So it is a great privilege to welcome our guest speaker for today, Beth Chase. And she's leading us into the conversation of God's precept seen in the life of Deborah. Now, we are so excited about Beth. She lives in the state of Tennessee with her husband, who is working for the Gideons International. And she used to be previously the Tennessee State Auxiliary cha Chaplain for the Gideons International. But Beth, we look forward to your message. Well, ladies, wow. Um, when Carly first asked me to do this, I said, I am not putting my feet in that Russian Jordan River. No way, no way. And then the Lord said to me, yes, you are. So here I am today. What I want you to do is have your Bibles handy, which I'm sure you do. Have a pen and a piece of paper because I'm going to have you writing down some stuff and some reflection questions. We're going to be going through a lot of scripture. Thank you, Michelle, for going through these scriptures for me. Technology is not my thing. Thank you, Michelle. But I want to thank Mar Mariana and Mariska and Carly and Michelle and all those um, at, uh, um, wow, it's, it is a wow. Um, I'm just so privileged and honored and you are so um, gifted to be doing what you're doing with this huge ministry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, now I do use the King James uh, Bible version, but whatever ver version you have, you can make sure 
that the Lord is going to speak to you exactly how you need to be spoken to. So it doesn't matter what version you have. And um, I'm just the instrument that God is using. Uh, he's going to be speaking out to you. Hopefully it will be very clear what he has to say to you. I am just his willing vessel to share with you what we're going to share today. Um, I chose Deborah and we're going to go to Judges chapter four, verses one through five. Let's read that. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Ehud was dead. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose host was Sisera, which dwelt in Harasheth of the Gentiles. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had 900 chariots of iron, and 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and Mount Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. Well, first of all, the book of Judges is a hard book to read sometimes if you've read it because it exposes the depravity and corruption of the human heart. When there was no leader, the people sunk deep down into horrible abominations. They had no one to guide them. But the book of Judges also shows the grace and mercy of our Lord God. For when they cried out to the Lord, he would raise them up, a judge or leader who would subdue their enemy and put them back on the right course of following God. The scripture states that when the judge died, the Israelites did again evil in the sight of the Lord, as it says in Judges chapter 10, verse 6. So this is the climate that Deborah was living in. But who is Deborah? I would like to focus on her character. Her name literally means bee or honeybee. And if you think about that, a honeybee, what does a honeybee do? It follows the queen. It goes where the queen goes. It does everything that the queen says to do. What, and that's kind of how Deborah was. She followed the Lord explicitly and did what he wanted her to do. She was, of course, the only woman judge, as we know. So let's talk about her as judge. First of all, Deborah herself did not do anything. She was totally obedient to the Lord in everything she did. And what did she do? Or more specifically, what was her character and how did he use her obedience to follow him and do his will? Scripture says that she was a judge, but did she come about that suddenly? I don't think so. Scripture says she was a wife. We don't know if she had children, but we will find out as we go that she was like a mother to Israel. She was just a human being that accepted the call of the Lord. Deborah's calling started with her love for God and his word. Now, none of us understand everything all at once. It takes time to form a relationship with someone. This is specifically the case with our Lord, or especially the case with our Lord. We are talking God's mind here. He gives us bits and pieces of his word as we can bear or handle it. As Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Think about that. If he gave you everything that we needed to know, your mind would explode. I mean, there's just too much. There's just too much. And isn't it beautiful to know that you'll never know it all. So you can always find something new and beautiful in his, in his word. Deborah was learning and seeking God's word as she would chew on it and digest it into her thoughts and emotions. She stayed connected to the source and therefore our Lord was able to teach her. When we stay connected to Jesus Christ, the word of God, we too will be able to discern what his will is for us at each moment of our day. How do we do that? When our days are full of things to do and places to go, let alone all the distractions and unexpected disturbances that come along the way. What I do, stop for a moment, take a deep breath and speak a word of scripture. We just don't say it. We need to visualize his word. Now, I am not a good visualizer. I'm more black and white. God said it. I believe it. That's it. I am just now starting to stop when I read and memorize scripture and closing my eyes and putting myself right into the scripture. For example, 
uh, if we need strength, we can quote Nahum 1 7. It says, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows them that trust in him. So let's close our eyes and visualize this. Visualize Jesus physically embracing you, holding you up, protecting you from all the affliction you may be going through. You trust him so completely that you have not one ounce fear, like a child who just rests nestled in his or her mother's arms, father's arms, maybe even rocking back and forth, speaking gently to us, reassuring us that he knows, he sees, he hears. Isn't that encouraging? It's just so encouraging to know that he's got us in the palm of his hand. He knows us when we totally trust him, no matter what chaos may be going on in our lives, he is still good and that will never, ever change. Or maybe we need to not speak, to hold our tongue, as it says in James 1.19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to, to wrath. And I want you to do something. I want you to actually um, take hold of your tongue think of jesus taking hold of your tongue it, physically do it just take your fingers and hold on to your tongue and try to speak a word now you're going to be able to utter sounds and things like that but you're not going to be able to audibly speak a word if you really hold on to your tongue if you really do it you can't you can't say anything so think of jesus holding on to your tongue and listening to what he's saying or what that other person is saying and in that case you can't speak any angry words. You can't say anything. All you can do is listen. So I have a reflection question for you. And I'm going to put this on the screen. And we're going to take two minutes to give you a chance to maybe write something down if you'd like. God has given us the ability to envision things we may not have seen with our physical eyes. Yet, we often don't use this gift when it comes to his word. So are you able or can you visualize how his word has spoken to you? Take a few minutes and just think of a scripture that maybe you've put yourself right into it and you've allowed his, his, his vision to just physically or visually see that scripture. Take a, take a minute or two. So in order for Deborah to judge her people, she needed this intimate relationship with the God who called her. And remember, none of the prophets had written anything yet. She just had the Torah or the first five books of the Bible. We have it all. There is nothing more that we need. It's all been written, praise God. Deborah was able to judge well because of all this. It's interesting to note that of all the people, male and female, in Israel at that time, only Deborah was called. 
because of her strong faith, she was willing to serve God first, and that in turn led her to give of herself to others. We as women of the word never need to be in competition with one another or compare ourselves with one another. This is an area of my life where I struggle. Maybe you're like me. I'm a perfectionist, which causes me to want to be the best at everything. The best this, the best teacher, the best wife, the best, the best mom, the best, you know, at this, at this, at blah, 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 blah. And that in turn causes me to compare myself with others who are better than me, and they all are, and become critical of them as I want myself to do better than them. So I kind of end up putting them down. It's a terrible state of mind to be in. It is sinful because it's a focus on myself. So now I have another reflection question for you. As women of the word, we need never be in competition with one another or compare ourselves to each other. Do you compare yourself or compete with others? Take a couple minutes to think about that. Well, I chose the promise precepts because Deborah was all into God's word. She loved his word. Psalm 119, 105, we pro probably can all quote that. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I'll think about this. He has a lamp on our feet so we can see our feet. And he has a light on our path. Now, it's not a floodlight. So we can't see that far ahead. We can't see to the right or the left, but we can see straight ahead. He gives us enough light to know exactly where we need to go at that moment in time. I just think that's so beautiful. It was the way our Lord spoke to Deborah. Everything she needed at that particular time to guide her and shine light on her path was found in his word. Everything she needed for guidance was found in his words. It's the same with us today. As is written in Hebrews 1, 2, God has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. God speaks to us through Jesus Christ, his son, who is the word. Everything we need for guidance is found in Jesus Christ, the word. Deborah was no different than any other human being, male or female. The whole reason she judged Israel and went with Barak to war is because she knew her creator. Deborah testifies to a life where God and his word are first and foremost. She didn't just decide for herself that she wanted to judge. She was in constant relationship with almighty God. Too often we make decisions without going to God first. The more we take time to be in his presence by being in his word, it will become almost involuntary 
to go to him first. He knows the urgency of each and every situation. We need never worry that we will respond in the wrong way when we go to him first. But if we're not going to him by seeking him in his word on a daily, sometimes hourly basis, we will rely on our own way of handling the situation and our emotions will take over and we will do, as it says in Judges 21, 25, what was right in our own eyes. And that's what the people did when they didn't have the God as their guide, when they rejected him, when they just did what, what they wanted to do. And it ended up a disaster. Deborah was so in touch with God that he could easily talk to her and teach her. She submitted to him. It's not a question of male or female again. It's a question of who belongs to him, who identifies with him, and who becomes the clay and lets him be the potter. Too often we see in our society people who lead by swaying others to come to their way of thinking, which always leads to disaster. For if that person doesn't know the Lord or doesn't have a relationship with him, they will lead people in an ungodly path. These people can be very persuasive. It may even seem like they are the real deal when it comes to the truth of his word. This is why we must do as the scripture says in Acts 17, 11. The Berean Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They didn't trust what Paul was saying. Remember, they only had the Old Testament. So they didn't trust everything that Paul said. They went and searched it out. Is this so? And that's what we need to do too. We can't believe what people are saying unless they're quoting the word of God, but make sure they're quoting the word of God. You go to the word of God and make sure it's the truth. So we talked about her as judge. Now we're going to talk to her, talk about her as prophet or prophetess. Now, there were no prophets yet. But wait, it does say that Deborah was a prophetess. Well, what actually is a prophet? Well, I did a Google on this and I got a Google definition. It's pretty good. It says, the primary role of a prophet is to make known the word of God. And this often involved calling people back to obedience to God. They denounced injustice, idolatry, and empty rituals. So as you can imagine, it can be very dangerous to be a prophet, especially in the time of the judges, for the people were steeped in idolatry and just plain ungodliness. She must have been highly respected because she let the people know the wrong way they were going and how they needed to get back to God, and they still came to her for resolving their conflicts. Her heart ached for her people. I believe she actually wept the way they had turned from God. Just like a mother hears her mother's instinct, weeps for her children when they run from God rather than run to him. She knew how it grieved God's heart because of how the people rejected him and went after other gods and it grieved her also. But she stayed in him and in his word. She knew that God would be with her since she probably knew what God had already done with the Egyptians and the many pagan nations that came against Israel how God protected them and provided for them. She knew that God told Joshua in Joshua 1.9, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, neither be you dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The Lord told Deborah what to do with Barak and how the battle would be fought. God told her the outcome. Barak would defeat Jabin, king of Canaan, Sisera, the leader of Jabin's army, and the whole Canaanite army. Now, fear could have gripped Deborah. This is a tough task. She was going to not fight, but she was going to go to war with them. And this could have made her just so, so terrified. But she trusted the Lord to do what only he could do. So I have another reflection question for you. Oh, well, before I do that, before I do that reflection question, I'm going to read an article from a book. It's called Share Jesus Without Fear, and it's written by William Fay. Now, William Fay was not a very good guy before he came to Christ, and I just want to read a little bit of his, his uh, testimony of what he was like before he came to Christ, so you have an idea of who we're dealing with here or who's writing this book. 
and how the word of God can change her life. He says in his, um, his words, he says, my resume spelled P-O-W-E-R, power. I was the president and CEO of a multi-million dollar international corporation. I had ties with a mob and I owned one of the larger houses of prostitution in the United States. I was involved in racketeering, bookmaking and gambling. I had a gold Rolex, chauffeured limo, money, my fourth wife and trophies from my many racquetball championships. I felt I had everything the, wor the world spelled success. And I mocked anyone who dared share his faith in God with me. This is what he was like before. There's, he has a long, long, long testimony in the back of what he went through. And he rejected Christ many, many times. He was witnessed to many times, but he still rejected. But I want to give you a little incident. This is many years after he's become saved. And he's telling everybody about Jesus now. This is an incident um, that he um, came to where it's the word of God that's going to save people. And I'm going to read what he wrote in this particular instance. So he says, one time I got a phone call at two in the morning from a pastor who did not want to deal with an intoxicated 17-year-old boy. I remember when Todd called me. He was so drunk, he vomited on the telephone and fell off his bed screaming. Yet he agreed to meet me the next day. I figured only the Holy Spirit could help him to remember our conversation. I borrowed... Frank Armenta, a friend of mine. Frank was on heroin for 28 years before Jesus found him or he found Jesus Christ. I didn't borrow Frank because of an inner city ex of his inner city experience. I borrowed Frank because he was the biggest guy I could think of. When I got to the restaurant, I realized I didn't have a clue what Todd looked like. I figured out if he really was that drunk that night, I would be able to spot him. Sure enough, here came a guy who looked like death warmed over. I looked at him and asked, are you Todd? When he said yes, I could see tears in his eyes. I turned to him and to Frank and said, let's get out of here. It was a hot day and we got in my car and rolled down the windows. We drove down the road to find a place that was cool. We stopped in front of a shady tree that happened to be front in front of the Denver County Jail. Frank sat and prayed while I asked Todd to read Romans chapter 10, verses nine to 11 out loud. This is what Todd read. That if thou can, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. I asked him, what does this say to you, Todd? Suddenly, now I'm gonna be a little dramatic here because um, I'm gonna speak in a demon voice, but I think it sounded like. Suddenly, another voice, a de demonic voice came out of Todd and said, it cannot save him. My hair stood straight up, Bill said. I ignored the voice and said, read it again. After all, I'm not gonna fight with this demon. Let God defend his word. He's been doing it for eternity. Todd read it again, out loud, and the voice got nastier. It cannot save him or anyone else. We repeated this process 10 to 12 times before the word of God broke through. As it did, a horrible shriek from Todd, rose from Todd as the nasty spirit left. We repeated this process 10 to 12 times before, oh, it's, I'm sorry. Todd was weeping in the back of my car, broken for his sin. Suddenly, his hands shot up as he praised God. For 10 minutes, he alternated between weeping and praising God. Now, I don't know if anybody of us will ever have to go through a dramatic experience with a demon. However, it can be very dangerous sometimes to share the word of God. And the best way to do it is to let them read it out loud. Read it out loud because that's where the devil has to flee. He has no power over the word of God. So my reflection question is, sharing the truth and love can sometimes feel daunting. But when we choose to communicate with love and compassion, we create an environment where others feel valued and understood. So 
write down some thoughts maybe. Have you ever shared the truth in love, the gospel, even when it was challenging or even dangerous to do so? I can give you a couple minutes. Oh, she's a judge, she's a prophetess, and now she's a songwriter, she's a songster. She was a songwriter and a singer. She sang of the Lord's praises for avenging Israel in chapter five. All of chapter five in Judges is about her singing praises to the Lord. She praised and thanked those who came to help Barak. In verse four, she praised God for sending the rain. As you remember, Sisera had 900 chariots. And guess what? They all got stuck in the mud. Before God raised up Deborah, the Israelites were getting sloppy. They were going back to their lazy ways, but the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun rallied to fight. When our battles are over and our Lord has answered our prayer, we should and must sing to the Lord, thanking and praising him for what he did. This is what Deborah did. She not only wrote her own lyrics, she put them to music. When we put scripture to music, it's so much easier to memorize. There are several scriptures that I learned when I was, you know, in first saved, and they're little choruses is what we call them, but they were put to music, and I'm going to sing a couple of them for you, and let's go. There's, there's six of them and six scriptures. First, we're going to go to Psalm 63, three to four. That says, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. And I learned it like this. Your loving kindness is better than life. Your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee. I will lift up my hands to your name. That was one of them. Then we go to Psalm 107, verse 2. You might even know these. These You might have learned them also. But Psalm 107, 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And I learned it like this. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, praise the Lord. And then Psalm 57, 5, that one says, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And I learned it like this. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. May your glory be over all the earth. And then we'll go to Psalm 18, 46. It says, the Lord lives and blessed be my rock 
and let the God of my salvation be exalted. And that one goes like this. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. And this next one, 1 John 4, 7 and 8, actually the address is actually in the little chorus. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And I, learned, I love this one. I learned this one like this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God, he that loves not, knows not God, for God is love. So, beloved, let us love one another, first John 4, 7 and 8. And so the last one is kind of a little clappy one. It's Isaiah 55, 12. And that one goes, for you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. And this is how I learned this one. We shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap, shall clap, shall clap their hands. And though the trees of the field shall clap their hands, the trees of the field shall clap their hands, the trees of the field shall clap their hands, we go out with joy. Now, you don't have to um, um, make your own tune. You can, you can sing scripture to uh, jingle bells, you know, like, um, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus all the way. I mean, it's just so beautiful when you take his word and put it to music and you can do that with anything. So in closing, as you can probably see from this session, his word is what we need every day, every minute of the day, always. Deborah knew it. It was probably told her by word of mouth, by the reading of the word to her and by what God said in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses six to nine. And we will go to that. Matt says, and these words, which I command you this day shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently unto your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. So. Do you think Deborah may have been taught by her parents? Do you think she saw his word or parts of it posted on the walls of her room? What about binding on the hand? This is called a phylactery. And we're gonna show you some pictures of that. The Greek word means amulet. Phylacteries were small leather boxes that contained Torah verses written on parchment. They were worn on the arms and forehead during morning prayers. In Bible times, only men were allowed to wear them, but wouldn't you think Deborah saw this? So even as corrupt as Israel was in Deborah's day, there were still those like her who devoted themselves to his word. I see and know um, many of you who post scripture verses all over your house, your car, your workplaces, or wherever you will see them. This is exactly what was done in biblical times with God's word. They didn't have the scrolls to carry around with them, and we can't always carry our Bible, but we can make sure that we have visual access to his word. The more we see it, the more we can memorize it and keep it in the heart of our minds. I'm a Psalm 119 girl. I love his word. I think on it, memorize it, visualize it, and quote it back to our Lord. But it's not enough to know it. We need to act on it. When we have it in our minds and our hearts, we will trust and obey our Lord to do what he calls us to do. May we love him first, then loving others will come. Deborah knew his word, loved his word, and obeyed his word. That is why she was a prophetess, a judge, and a songwriter. May we all stay in his word as we all have different gifts, so the Lord can use us in the way he has gifted each one of us. So let's pray. Oh, precious Father, 
May we all, like Deborah, stay fervently and earnestly in your word. May we look back and see all the wonderful things you have done for us and are doing for us and are going to do for us. May your word speak to us gently when we need our emotions to be calmed down because we're so sensitive. But may we hear your word shout loudly when you need to get our attention. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Father, for loving us first. And thank you, Father, for all that you do, all that you are, not so much what you do, but who you are. You are the truth. You are the way. You are the life. You are the word of God. And we give you the praise and glory and honor in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. Faith, wow, thank you so much for this profound message. You truly have a voice of an angel that brings vibrancy and joy to God's word. And as you've beautifully reminded us, God's word is truly a guiding light and an anchor in the storm. For by his word, all things were created and through it, everything is sustained. And just as Deborah has placed his word central to her life, so should we. We are called to write his word on the tablets of our hearts and meditate it on a day and night. And your powerful reminder emphasizes that his word is our constant source of comfort, nourishment, and wisdom. God supplies all our needs in his word and by his word, Jesus Christ. And so thank you for sharing with us this essential truth. For our Facebook listeners, we thank you that you've joined us today and we look forward to